tries to say something substantive about religion. Yeah. Whereas otherwise, quite a lot of it is directly political. Right. And trying to say, oh, Israel, Lebanon, Northern Ireland, Iraq, that can all be explained by religion. Yeah. You know? It seems ridiculous. I mean, it is ridiculous on its face. And you'd expect somebody that spent so much time in the socialist movement to actually... I mean, he's probably said somewhere else directly, like, I, that's a stupid explanation. To a degree, yeah, but he always did have a certain vulgar um, uh, conception of religion. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't as important in his politics. Right, right. Um, and he tried to dress, up, dress it up as a Marxist analysis, and it was really, it was really not. Yeah. Um, anyway. I'm here with uh, Richard Steemore, who's author most recently of uh, Unhitched, The Trial of Christopher Hitchens. Um, he's also uh, the lead contributor to uh, Lenin's Tomb, uh, one of the UK's most uh, popular and widely read blogs. Um, so uh, thanks for being with us, Richard. Thank you very much. First thing I want to ask is, um, I mean, the, your, your book Unhitched is, um, is very, very funny and a very effective uh, uh, takedown um, of, of Hitchens, but why did you feel that it was important to, to, to write this book um, at this particular time? Oh, good point. Um, look, when he died, um, the conversation about Christopher Hitchens was um, quite predictably led and maintained by his most devoted fans, um, quite a few of, few of whom are um, interspersed through the culture industry, the mass media, you know, um, there were Charlie Rose specials about it. There were documentaries, radio broadcasts. Hitchens is one of the few writers to have died, probably the only one, to go to his grave with benedictions from uh, a prime minister, in this case Tony Blair, and a president, in this case George W. Bush. So um, he obviously was an extremely resonant uh, cultural figure. And what I found interesting is that, um, to me at least, um, he achieved the most fame, the most accolades, um, and the most rewards, uh, financially and in other ways too, um, during the last 10 years of his life when he was least convincing as an intellectual and a polemicist. So um, I wanted to understand something about that. I, I mean, partly it's a book about why did Hitchens move from the left to the right, which um, to me makes an interesting case study. And it's worth uh, discussing in itself because he... Um, seems to be, um, in many ways, quite unusual and aberrant. Um, uh, but actually, when you look into it, you find that there are certain um, uh, consistencies with past generations of uh, apostates, the neoconservatives, the um, uh, generation of socialists who moved to the right during World War I. Um, you know, one, one can go back and find certain continuities. But um, also just the fact that uh, I think Christopher Hitchens is an interesting figure in himself. Um, partly because of his uh, complexities and the um, contradictions of his ideology and character. Yeah, so you, one, one thing you mentioned um, as worth further discussion, so, so I, I want to discuss it more, is this, is this sort of particular character of Hitchens' apostasy. So, uh, which, you know, there's obviously tons of it, um, particularly in sort of U.S. intellectual culture, you had a whole number of people who became neoconservatives, who before yeah. were, were associated um, with, with the left and even the anti-Stalinist left. Um, unlike them, Hitchers, Hitchens sort of maintained that he, he always had socialist um, uh, convictions. Um, so if uh, maybe you could discuss like the importance of that and sort of the character of K Hitchens uh, you know, move to the right, and then what you think, though, some of the underlying similarities are with that whole with that whole trend amongst uh, amongst that whole class of people. It's important to say um, precisely what Hitchens um, claimed for himself. He said that he was still an ethical socialist. He still thought very much as a socialist in an ethical way. But he told Reason magazine in 2001 he could no longer claim to be a socialist because he maintained there was a no longer a serious socialist critique of capitalism and B, no longer uh, a working class movement capable of realizing socialist ideals. Um, and that he had uh, reluctantly come to that conclusion um, in the decade following the end of the Cold War. And I think that's actually quite a believable story if you look back at the uh, trajectory of his writing. Um, I think actually it's quite interesting. Had there been, instead of 9-11, um, the Arab Spring 10 years ago, quite a lot of intellectuals would have ended up in a very different position and probably Hitchens among them. So um, this is not to uh, underestimate the degree of careerism and opportunism. Um, 
um, in Hitch and Shift to the right, which I'll come back to. Okay, so the, um, um, the, he maintained throughout that he didn't repudiate his past. Okay? And that's quite unlike many other intellectuals. And the way in which he was able to do this was he was able to say, look, given that socialism has basically disappeared from the world map, given that there's no movement capable of realizing it, all we have left is liberal capitalism, and it is the American Revolution, and it's the only revolution left standing. It is the most revolutionary force on the planet. Um, and in large parts of the world, it would be a step up. And when he was interviewed about this in a uh, magazine, 3AM magazine, 2007, he was asked, don't you think you're just giving cover for a bunch of neoliberals and profiteers? You know, they want to go over and conquer Iraq. They want to exploit all the money, get everything uh, they can out of the country. And you're also buying into the fiction that there's some inherent connection between a free market and a free society. And he held his hand up and said, look, I think there is uh, some sort of connection between a free market and a free society. At least there seems to be one. And actually, if you look back at Hitchens' um, uh, trajectory over 30 or 40 years, you find that there were elements of sympathy with a certain kind of libertarian or neoliberal rightism. He um, certainly disclosed it later in his life, um, that he was fond of Mrs. Thatcher, for example, not just, <laughs> not just her sex appeal. I mean, he often told the story um, of an encounter with uh, the Iron Lady, um, which uh, culminated in his being lightly spanked with a rolled up parliamentary order paper and called a naughty boy. <laughs> Um, and he told this over and over again. He thought she was very sexy. Um, but he also admired certain aspects of her politics. He thought that they were, the Thatcherites were right on some fundamental things. And I think really what he admired was um, the aspect of her that was, you know, uh, reforming the state, reforming the economy, um, introducing market-driven forms and breaking with the old state-driven sort of um, social democracy, tax-funded statism. Um, and the old labor machine, because uh, he thought that that was boring, it was stayed, it was, it was crusty, it was not working. And also, it was um, sort of part of that whole, the, sort of the period of social democracy was part of that whole nadir of England um, after the end of the empires. You know, it, England felt a much smaller, damper, and more cramped and narrow space uh, in, in the sort of imagination of some uh, sort of English writers. Um, and Hitchens' uh, sympathy for uh, Philip Larkin in this context is actually very interesting, because Larkin was really, in many ways, um, a sort of end-of-empire poet, um, not always consciously, but... So, um, he had sympathy with Mrs. Thatcher, and he certainly sympathized with elements of her sort of British nationalism. I think he had um, a, an underplayed sort of patriotism at the core of his character, partly imbibed from his father, who was a naval commander uh, so in the British Empire. Um, what he didn't like about Mrs. Thatcher was that she was a supporter of um, the racist re regime in Rhodesia um, and then a supporter of the racist regime in South Africa. And it was the authoritarian and racist um, sort of um, response of the sort of Thatcherites that he really didn't like, their traditionalism, moral traditionalism. And this is interesting because when in his last ten, ten years he moved to the right, I think he moved to what I would characterize as a sort of modern neoliberal right. Um, he could still criticize the traditional right. He could criticize the segregationists, you know, the, 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 the traditional racists. Um, and he could criticize the religious right. Very easy to do so and still cast himself as somehow a dissident in the opposition. Um, and so uh, I think there are lines of continuity with his past beliefs. And I think what happened after 9-11 was that the sort of complex elements in his political character really got shaken up and the most conservative and reactionary elements came to the fore, um, and any radical or revolutionary ideas that he'd had were subdued massively. Right, right. So um, maybe as, as part of that, um, you could talk a little bit about uh, the development of uh, Hitchens' Islamophobia, which yeah. is very, you know, Hitchens becomes one of the sort of key figures in the so-called new atheist, yeah. uh, well, one hesitates to say movement, but phenomenon. Yeah. Um, so uh, what, um, you know, are there any hints of that in his earlier development and then how does that come out as, you know, such a major thematic and then his, his sort of last period? He always uh, had a, a very pronounced distaste for religion. 
Um, if you go back to, for example, his 1982 essay, The Lord and the Intellectuals, written for Harper's Magazine, he um, describes uh, what he characterizes as the Marxist position on religion. And he quotes the famous quote from Marx where uh, he said, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the spirit of spiritless conditions. It is the opiate of the masses. Um, and Hitchens said, you know, this isn't uh, the way people have often interpreted it as saying that religion is merely uh, a drug, um, but rather um, that Marx was saying that r there is um, a chord of credulity in all of us which is merely waiting to be struck, and it's more likely to be struck if it comes in the guise of a, uh, of a often humanitarian or humane appeal which religion dresses itself up in. Now, to me, that is not uh, what Marx was saying. <laughs> Um, that is actually uh, another vulgarization and another distortion. But that is really what he believed. I think he ultimately believed that religion comes from a transcendental impulse that we all have, um, and religion purports to satisfy it, but it's a false satisfaction. Um, and he often was resorted to psychologistic and um, actually ultimately sort of um, biologically deterministic accounts of religion. I mean, he thought it was to do with our, our <laughs> underformed primate brains, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> so um, uh, there was always an element of that. What con the shift comes with, first of all, with Rushdie, his uh, friend Salman Rushdie, who was, he always had a tendency to idealize everybody that he was um, sort of made a hero out of. He couldn't brook too much criticism of them. And this was certainly true of Rushdie. Now, the fact is that Rushdie was um, threatened with death. There were um, assassination attempts. People did end up dying. There were, were serious riots. But Hitchens' response to that, I mean, it was limited because he could only deal with the aspect of it. That this is about free speech. Under the American Constitution, everybody has a right to free speech. And um, that is uh, better than just censoring him. Now, he did also say that the right wing, who were basically uh, attacking Rushdie, um, were mistaken. Um, to have a go at Rushdie for um, attacking Islam because that's not what he was doing. What he was in fact doing um, was uh, satirizing uh, through fantasy um, some uh, traditional ideas or elements of Islam but also mixing it up with other ideas, Christian ideas and so on. And he also said that the vast majority of Muslims um, can't be um, spoken for by the number of Muslims that happen to be on the streets or that happen to be kicking up a fuss. In other words, that Muslims aren't all one monolithic block. So he took it, what I would consider to be a more or less principled stance, um, not unproblematic in some ways in that he didn't really talk about the underlying politics of it, the rise of uh, con contesting fundamentalisms, um, Zionism being very important in the global conjuncture, the fact that uh, uh, religious identities were becoming increasingly racialized, um, and the fact that Muslims themselves were being subject to these particular um, pressures to identify as a Muslim or just not have an identity, you know. So there was this, um, and he was very naive about this, but nonetheless he acknowledged, um, uh, it, if only in passing, that there was a question of imperialism and that, you know, Muslims didn't all speak with one voice. In uh, later years, um, in supporting um, Bosnian Muslims, of course, um, he had to um, stake out a very traditional sort of liberal cosmopolitan and multicultural point of view. Um, so he would attack people uh, like um, Daniel Pipes, who is a you know, major Islamophobe, um, and denounce him for, for claiming that you know, um, the Iranian regime was some great threat. Um, or that Islamists were a, a global threat. So there was none of this clash of civilization stuff that came after 9-11, but there was um, a certain sense, I mean, he did say at one point in the context of the Rushdie affair, you know, we have to break with this idea that religious ideas are caused by material circumstances. You have to admit that these things might even have a damn life of their own. That's what, where he was headed. So. After 9-11, um, he executed one of his sudden 180 um, turns, which he often did without explaining himself. 
um, and it took, it was about two weeks after the actual event uh, where he suddenly decided that the left were apologists for uh, fascism, that uh, this uh, sort of Islamist uh, menace was rooted in Islam, according to him, rooted in a certain um, psychological trauma um, that manifests itself in Islam, um, and uh, that it was a form of fascism. Even then, even after 9-11, uh, religion did not immediately come to the fore, um, and it wasn't the major object of his criticism. Rather, um, he stressed that the United States was, as I said, the world's only revolutionary force. It was the world historical force of progress uh, that the so-called Islamo-fascists would have to give away. Um, they couldn't win even if they wanted to, just because they were on the wrong side of history. He always had this crude notion of historical progress. Um, and, and he um, stressed the, the, the uh, focus on Iraq. Uh, from 2002 onwards. By 2005, um, that's when I think the picture was changing and religion became much more important for him. I think there are a number of reasons. One of them is that he must have noticed the success that Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins had had with their books attacking religion. And, you know, there was a market. Yeah. <laughs> and he thought, I can do that. I've got a history of doing that. So, I mean, you, you, can't, you can never underestimate the role of money and careerism. But also, um, he had to explain how it was that uh, the occupation of Iraq wasn't the promised liberation. He said, there will be no war, so bring it on. There will be uh, you know, a, a massive landing of food aid, medicine, laptop computers. He actually <laughs> said laptop computers. You know, this is what he was, he was uh, prophesying for Iraq. Um, and this would be delivered by the Bush administration in tandem with a small group of Iraqi exiles whom he called uh, Democrats, actually led by a crook named Ahmed Chalabi, um, who he defended to the, to the end. Um, so, um, suddenly um, he has an explanation. Everything would have been just fine if it wasn't for the religious people. And he doesn't just focus on political Islam, because he didn't know much about political Islam. Rather, um, what he knew about were, were some of the great writings of um, atheism and atheist uh, ide ideas uh, and secularism. Um, and so he decided to write in that context and say, you know, the problem is underlying this is, is religious ideas. Uh, they are inherently totalitarian ideas. He rediscovered the language of totalitarianism, which he had previously rejected. Uh, they are despotic ideas, essentially the idea that there is a, a great um, uh, dictator father figure in the sky who's constantly watching over you, from whom you get no rest. Um, and so this um, is this comical, um, childish interpretation of religion, the sorts of things that you might expect a precocious nine-year-old to come up with, <laughs> in all seriousness, you know, and you think, oh, he's quite smart to come up with that. Hitchens was turning 50, you know, I mean, he should have known better. But, so he, he wrote um, his book, God is Not Great. It was his best-selling book ever, and it also was his worst book ever. I mean, it was very badly researched, and it was extremely reductionist. I come from Northern Ireland, um, and um, I, I grew up during the Troubles, uh, as they were called. And no one had ever referred to the Irish Republican Army or the Ulster Volunteer Force as religious gangs until Christopher Hitchens did. I mean, it just, I mean, I'd never heard that before. Um, and Hitchens must have known this because he had reported from Northern Ireland. He, he knew the situation very well. So this was um, uh, basically made up. It was manufactured. Uh, these were uh, tr primarily political sort of gangs, loyalist and Republican, um, who existed to, you know, to win a war. And he did the same thing with Lebanon, uh, with Israel, Palestine, increasingly, um, and with Iraq. And essentially, um, I got the feeling coming from Northern Ireland that there was, uh, and this, we, we got this from Dawkins as well, uh, that there was this, um, uh, the idea that, that you're a colonial backwater and you're killing each other because of your stupid backward ideas. I mean, that's essentially, so it's a very condescending, elitist and metropolitan attitude. But it was not the basis for an analysis. And so that's why it, I think it happens to be one of his uh, worst books. Um, so it's bound up with both um, uh, illiterate scholarship and politics that, uh, to me, are profoundly dubious. And actually, in practice, in the context of Iraq, it meant that um, 
no matter what happened, um, anything could be justified in the context of fighting these barbarian sort of Muslims. Um, he said, for example, of Fallujah that too few people had died because too many jihadis had escaped. And this is Fallujah where 8,000 people were killed and so many buildings, half the uh, mosques and so many houses were destroyed. So it was not just a reductionist, um, uh, uh, it was actually uh, a, a extremely brutal and reactionary form of politics. And one last thing about that, um, he often represented this as a materialist critique of religion. I would actually say that first, he first of all represented complex material circumstances um, as caused by religious ideas, and secondly, treated those ideas uh, in a simplistic, uh, essentialist and literalist manner. In other words, rather than treating um, religious ideas as a sort of labour of interpretation where people derive meanings that are adequate to their real life circumstances, um, he treated it as um, something that you could read off of literally from the texts and there was only one meaning that you could read off of. So in other words, this, the social realities that he was commenting on and describing were caused essentially by bad ideas and that's it. That is not a materialist critique of religion, it's an idealist interpretation of reality. So uh, I want to actually go, go back to something you mentioned um, earlier, but the, to, to shift the conversation uh, sure. away from our friend Chris Hitchens for, for good. You mentioned Thatcher, and of course she's just croaked, and I think there's been a very interesting discussion in, amongst the left about how to interpret her legacy. That's something that I think um, you've participated in, I think you wrote, uh, you know, ironically, you know, admiring, I think you called it on Facebook, yeah. uh, obituary. Um, so, uh, you know, what uh, I mean, what do you think is, like, how, how should we interpret Thatcher's legacy? Like, what's the basic way that, um, you know, looking back on it, we can, we can think about, you know, uh, what she did and what her effect on, you know, British and then sort of world society has been? She um, was, I would say, in uh, the terms of the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, uh, a modern prince of the right. Um, and that meant that uh, she intervened at a moment of great danger and crisis, not just for British capitalism, but for the Conservative Party um, as its dominant political representation. Um, and this was in the sort of 1970s when the Heath administration, the Conservative administration of Ted Heath, had been defeated by strikes and protests, you know, really seriously. I mean, they, the government had to call an, an emergency election to say, who runs the country, us or the miners? <laughs> and the voters said, not you. Um, <laughs> so they were voted out, and uh, this really enraged the, the emerging new right in the Conservative Party, many of whom had been inspired by the um, racist Enoch Powell, because one of the things that's underestimated about Enoch Powell, um, he was a passing figure, but he pioneered a form of populist right-wing free market politics that could gain a popular base by using nationalism and racism, which, um, they, you know, in the post-war period, the done thing was just to uh, keep your base, uh, popular base happy by giving them a welfare state. Enoch showed you didn't have to do that. So the new right was emerging. They were galvanized by this. They were infuriated. They were determined to inflict an historic revenge, especially on the miners. And Thatcher um, was uh, almost accidentally the candidate to do that. It would have been the um, uh, much more intellectual uh, Keith Joseph who um, was a, a leader of a right-wing think tank and a very serious figure within the Conservative Party. But then he made a speech um, basically uh, supporting eugenics for the poor um, because, you know, the problem is we're breeding too many um, of the underclass. You know, that was essentially the idea. And that um, cost him uh, any chance of the leadership. So he stood down. Mrs. Thatcher said, well, somebody representing our views has to stand, so I'm going to stand. So she stood. And the popular press, which had until that point been largely social democratic and labor, had been uh, sort of gradually being colonized by the new right. They switched to this sort of radical right-wing agenda and they supported Mrs. Thatcher. Um, and throughout the next few years, uh, when labor was back in office, it was um, presiding over the decline of the social democratic settlement unemployment was soaring, it was implementing cuts in public spending in order to appease the International Monetary Fund, 
and it was implementing a, a form of monetarist politics based on the doctrines of Milton Friedman. And it was retreating from its traditional sort of welfareist agenda. And very importantly, it had implemented something called the social contract. But this was a sort of traditional corporatist mechanism whereby the unions, the government and businesses would make an agreement about prices and wages. Okay? So they set an incomes policy that wages would go uh, rise no higher than 5% each year. At a time when inflation was 20% a year, you know, this was actually a massive uh, cut in living standards. So people experienced this as a, 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 a serious crisis. A cut in living standards, increasing amounts of violence, pardon me, increasing amounts of violence and um, chaos on the streets. And then there was the winter of discontent when um, the um, union leadership could no longer keep control of the rank and file workers and, and get them to accept this uh, social contract. And they started a, a, a spate of wildfire strikes. The right wing press and the Thatcherite media successfully represented this, all these experiences, as a crisis not of a rightward moving Labour leadership and um, a complicit trade union bureaucracy and all the cuts in living standards that were coming with it, but actually as a crisis of socialism, creeping socialism, creasing, creeping collectivism. Mrs Thatcher is going to deal with because what she's going to do is she's going to get in there, um, flush out all the militants, um, make industries competitive, stop the overmanning of industry, and then Britain will be strong again, it will attract investment, uh, we will sell our goods to, uh, to, to consumers, and people's living standards will go up again. We can go back to the good old days, but only after a period of iron times, only after a time of our backs to the wall. Um, and that's, um, that's what she promised. She didn't promise good times. And so she had a certain period in time in which uh, things got really much, much worse under Mrs. Thatcher for a long time, um, for everybody, um, including her own base. Uh, unemployment soared, uh, manufacturing industries were destroyed. But as soon as the global economy started to turn around in around 1982, um, with um, Southeast Asia representing a major growth vector in the global economy, Thatcher, Thatcherism started to rebound. The, the, the loss of her votes started to go, you know, the, the, the hemorrhaging stopped and she started to regain lost voters. And in 1983, she won the election with some like 44% of the vote, and Labour uh, was historically down to its lowest vote with some like 27% of the vote. What that did, first of all, established the basis of, you know, we can cut spending in a recession and it's a good thing. She got rid of corporatism as a method of dealing with uh, trade unions and uh, companies. Uh, she had uh, started to bring in businessmen to run the NHS and so on, uh, and bring market ideas into the state. The second victory enabled her to uh, roll out the second part of her plan, which was, we're going to um, bust up the unions one after the other. We'll take, a, take on a weaker one at first, so they'd already picked a few fights with steel workers and others, and then we go after the big battalions. So they planned a fight with the miners, and they set it up. They'd already planned by uh, building up the police forces, mobile police squads that could go around the country and smash up uh, flying pickets, for example. Uh, they also stocked up on coal so that the strike wouldn't have much effect. Um, it did have an effect, but not as much as it would have had. Um, so they, uh, they really had a plan for a fight. And you have to understand, this administration was filled with these, what you might call self-made men, sort of people from the working class or lower middle class who had made it and who got a lot of money. And they were um, uh, very competitive and hierarchical in their thinking. They didn't like unions, they didn't like socialism. So they were real class fighters, far more so than the traditional sort of elites, and far more so than today's conservative leadership. Um, they smashed up the unions, they defeated the miners' strike, and after that, um, with the, the, where they enjoyed the support of Rupert Murdoch and the Sun newspaper um, and all his uh, press outlets, they went and supported him in smashing up the print unions uh, and helping him move production to Wapping on a much more uh, 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 cheap, on a much cheaper basis. And the result was a massive increase in his profitability and in his ideological power because he could expand his holdings in the media. And because, of course, when he didn't have to worry about unions, they couldn't black out his front pages, which they had done during the miners' strike, for example. So Thatcher engineered, I mean, she didn't do it alone, and she didn't do it in circumstances that were entirely uh, you know, unpropitious for her but she did intervene in a situation in which the elements were in flux. Uh, 
and she organized them in a particular way um, and totally um, changed the way in which the state was organized, totally changed the functioning of the economy, totally demolished um, the traditional basis of working class and left-wing power. Um, and one of the major uh, effects of this was to change the Labour Party. She said, um, and always said towards the end of her life, that her greatest achievement was Tony Blair. What she meant by that was, of course, that Tony Blair was a Thatcherite in charge of the Labour Party, a man who despised unions in charge of a party form formed by, and more or less for, for the trade unions. Um, so she engineered an historic um, shift, one that has not been rival matched on the continent. No other working class in Europe has been um, subject to as comprehensive a series of defeats as in Britain. We're all subject to some of the same sorts of processes, but this was quite severe. Um, and that accounts for some of the world uh, historic weakness of the left in general, but particularly in Britain. You wrote what, what I thought was a brilliant intervention uh, on Lenin's tomb about uh, the actuality of a successful capitalist um, offensive. Um, it seems to me, though, that like, uh, and, and I thought that was quite right. Um, it seems to me that some of a contrast with what was going on in sort of the successful capitalist offensive in the, in the Thatcher is that we actually have um, political leaders that are almost universally discredited. Yeah. Um, so there isn't, uh, you know, I, I, there isn't, you know, the, the, I think the, uh, the conservative leadership in Britain is, is widely disliked. Um, I think most European governments are widely disliked. So it seems that, um, although, you know, it's, I don't think it was ever the case that Thatcher was, you know, universally loved, I think sure. that was a mythology. Yeah. Um, certainly there was a, there was an element of, of galvanizing a section of, of public opinion behind Absolutely, her. Yeah. Here that seems, and, and I don't know if you agree, it seems less so. So I guess if, if that's the case, how has it, how has it been possible that we've seen you know, uh, a successful austerity offensive without the same kind of, you know, uh, ideological armament um, that, that, that we did in, in the late 70s and early 80s? Uh, everybody's running on empty. Um, essentially, uh, the, the British government is ideologically and politically weak. Um, the, uh, the people at the top of that government are not class fighters in the way that Thatcher and her allies were. Uh, these are largely people from the elite who they expect to govern the country, um, and they're quite complacent. And the reality is if, that, if the left and the um, working class movement, um, the labor movement, were to pull together and get something going in, by way of an opposition, I don't think it would take as much to inflict a defeat on them as it would have done on Thatcher. If David Cameron was faced with 1% of the opposition that Thatcher faced, I think he would wilt. Um, so they're a very weak leadership. But the fact is, the left is weak. And weakness and strengths are always relative, um, relative to context and relative to the contending forces. And the fact is that um, if uh, they're weak and we're weak, then the, you know we can't really crow about their being weak. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, um, a large part of uh, the weakness of the government is made up for, to an extent, by the state apparatus. Um, it was the civil service which drafted an ad hoc agreement, a set of ten rules or something, which allowed this coalition government to come into existence and which made it almost certain that it would be a conservative and liberal-led coalition government, not liberal labour. Um, but more importantly, it is they who've been driving the sort of policies um, that governments have been pursuing and which are now being radicalised. Um, it was the civil service policy to, for example, introduce tuition fees in the United Kingdom. Um, so, I mean, they are uh, bringing a degree of coherence and strength to a government that is fragmented along many lines. And I think the, um, a lot of the pressure for these policies uh, of austerity, um, I mean, the they're coming from all sorts of sources, but centrally, it's coming through the City of London uh, via the conduit of the Bank of England and the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, and these are fairly dominant forces within the, the uh, Exchequer, you know, uh, within uh, the um, Treasury, um, within uh, Number 10 Downing Street. So um, 
they have made up uh, for a lot of the, the weakness of the government. And actually, if you go and look at um, the opposition that has taken place, some of it has been quite militant. Um, the tra these uh, students' um, protests um, exploded in a way that nobody expected. And the police were caught off guard. But very quickly they recovered. And, you know, I mean, they, 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 I don't want to make them seem to be all-powerful because they were outwitted on a number of occasions by students. But it's also true that through sheer brutality, they managed to demobilize a lot of the students who would have otherwise been involved. They smashed people's heads in on the protests, that's one thing. Kettling people, meaning keeping them confined within a very small space and crushing them together. Um, and then on the sort of outlines of the kettle, you could have conflicts which would be filmed and the, they, they would use that as evidence of uh, criminality and riots and so on. Um, but also, sending letters to um, students uh, and their parents who were known to be ready to go to these protests saying, do not participate in any illegal action. I mean, not, for, not because they had actually participated in illegal action, but just to intimidate them. And this, um, this was um, uh, coterminous with um, a sort of a political agenda and a, and, a, and a political discourse which said to parents, discipline your children, make them stay at home. You know? So there was a whole series of things going on. There was also, um, later that year, because the student movement started to fall apart, especially after the law, um, tripling tuition fees, had passed. Um, within about um, uh, seven or eight months, there had been a series of riots across the UK. Um, well, particularly fo focused in England. Mm -hmm. And one of the th reasons for this was actually a crisis um, of the police force. Um, because, in, you know, increasingly there was revelations about police corruption, collusion with the Murdoch Empire, um, and uh, the Tories were in on that as well. Um, and the leadership uh, of the London Met uh, had recently stepped down. Now, this was um, in the context of the Murdoch scandal and the sort of um, the fact that they tipped um, or, or they'd uh, hacked a dead girl's voicemail. Um, and it was revealed the, the extent of police collusion with them. And then um, a local squad um, of armed police went out on the streets of Tottenham and uh, shot someone to death with a beast of a weapon, blew his chest out, really just, they, they, and they, they, they assassinated him on the spot, they murdered him. There were riots, predictably. There had been previous police brutality uh, which had produced protests, but this was just gonna produce riots. And the interesting thing was that this segued into a series of um, riots and protests about other things. I mean, generally speaking, it was focused on stage battles with the police. Young kids wanted to fight the police and win. So um, it, it, the net result of this was actually, um, for a time, the, the police were not able to keep control and the government was uh, sort of out of business. But after a while, um, the, sort of, the underlying sort of ideological work that had been done by the Thatcherites and by the Tories, and also increasingly by New Labour over the years, to demonize the poor, to demonize welfare recipients, to demonize people as chads, you know, which is basically um, a derogatory way of talking about a particular kind of poor person who doesn't dress well and is uneducated and whatever. Um, all this demonology meant that, um, that large sections of the population went absolutely mental and started calling for the army to intervene and start shooting people and deport them and whatever else, you know. So, um, uh, it's very interesting. Um, a lot of sources of, uh, surprising sources of strength emerge. The state seems to be in crisis, the government seems to be in crisis, it seems to be weak, and yet there seems to be enough work having been done already in terms of building up the forces of the state, building up riot police, building up uh, popular racism, building up popular support for neoliberalism and a certain kind of class supremacist ideology that saved them you know, from, from uh, the, themselves at the last moment. And of course, the most important thing they've accomplished, which makes it very difficult today, uh, is that they have so thoroughly and comprehensively demoralized the trade union leadership um, that they do not want to get into a sustained fight with the government. What they're engaged in strikes over is the extent to which they will accept serious cuts in their conditions and pay.
And what they want from this government is roughly the same as what they would have taken from a Labour government, which would, would have been a, a lousy deal. So that's, you know, that's the situation. Um, their strengths usually derive from weaknesses that we have inherited over the years. For, for those of us who are on the left, um, what, do you have any thoughts about what kind of activities should we look for? What kind of you know, strategies do we need to pursue to try and you know, uh, progress ourselves out of you know, some of the weak and you know, uh, some ineffectual state that, that we're in right now? Well, I think that one of the temptations to resist is the tendency to idealize um, a conception of trade union based strike action as the ultimate answer. You know, uh, whatever the problem is, we can find a trade union answer. Um, I think that's a temptation on the British left because there is still something of a trade union movement and it does have some potential social power if it uses it. Um, but the only serious victory for the working class in Britain in the last 30 or 40 years was a poll tax rebellion. And that uh, wasn't, uh, that was a, a genuinely a class-based rebellion. Um, and it worked by means of non-payment, mass protests, and ultimately riots. Um, and it defeated the government, brought down Thatcher, uh, and it uh, put an end to the tax. They had to bring in something else. Um, and I think this, uh, understanding why this is, involves understanding what Thatcherism and neoliberalism more generally effectively did to the working class, um, whether in Britain or elsewhere. And one of the things it did was, of course, to massively uh, demolish union organisation and uh, traditional forms of political organisation and left people fairly um, isolated and individualised. And it changed the nature of politics. When um, you look at the statistics over the last 30 or 40 years, you find that there's a massive increase in the participation in uh, social movements and protests of that kind. And people are trying to find ways of um, effective protest, you know, not just marching from A to B and, you know, being, having, having a nice rally, which can, can be good, but to um, do something that is sufficiently disruptive that those in charge have to um, stop what they're doing and take notice and actually um, possibly implement some changes to uh, adapt to it. Um, and I, I think uh, this is where the work of people like Francis Fox Pippen can be quite useful. Uh, she identified uh, a, a central concept, a strategic concept, as disruptive capacity. What that means is that we all participate in the system, we all make it work on a day-to-day -day basis through our actions, through our cooperation. If we stop cooperating, um, the system is in some ways in crisis. And different people situated differently within the system have different kinds of disruptive capacity. And I think that understanding the ways in which that can work and where, where this can be distributed strategically is more um, effective than simply uh, imagining that the best strikes or the best struggles will always take place at the point of production. They, they, I mean, that is still central, but I think we're going to see t some types of movements which are based on the traditionally unorganized sections of the working class. People who have never seen a trade union representative for 30 or 40 years. Um, the majority of workplaces in the UK, particularly in the private sector, have never seen a trade union representative. So um, I, I think finding ways to organize that doesn't rely on those sectors of workforce that are still unionized without forgetting them or writing them off or anything for a second. Um, I, I think in the UK one of the problems is that those who are um, unionized um, are largely public sector workers who have conditions and uh, benefits that most people don't have. Nobody's going to say that they, they should have that taken away, but the point is it does affect the extent to which they're going to be militant. To an extent, um, because they have a relatively, um, I don't want to say privileged position, but slightly better off position than most workers, um, theirs is more of a defensive fight to maintain some elements of what they have. Um, I think real militancy is going to come from people who are being pushed really far and hard. Um, and so we need to find ways of organizing politically that will uh, respond to that. And, and, and actually, very importantly, because the other risk is that we just hop from one sort of campaign to the next, um, 
And in the UK, what that actually means is your only allies, really, permanent allies, are trade union leaders, MPs and left-wing celebrities. And they're your constant allies and you form a new coalition and then another coalition. That treats the people who actually make up these movements and campaigns as mere steam to your piston. You know, they come, they dissipate, a new generation comes <laughs> and they dissipate. And there's no way that um, the successes, if you have any, are institutionalised. Um, and, and therefore preserved and, and, and f in, enable future struggles. There's no growth. So I think um, we need to organize to grow. Um, to me, that probably means you need a party. Um, uh, and uh, to me, you know, probably uh, as, as, as broad a party of the, um, the left as possible in the United Kingdom. But um, I think also we need other forms of campaigns that are based on what real people are actually doing, rather than you know, declaring a campaign in central London, which we so often have, a glittery gala of celebrities, and everybody comes along and hears a rousing rally, and they're told they're part of a campaign now. Uh, no, there are actual things going on. In the UK, for example, there is a major struggle going in in Sussex University over privatization. And this is going to affect not just the students, but the conditions and pay of the people who work in that university. The trade union hasn't been particularly effective, though one hopes that this will change. But the students have led an extremely militant series of actions, occupations, rolling occupations, expanding occupations, and they've encouraged the formation of what has been called a pop-up union. That is a sort of militant union that just exists there for the benefit of the workers who want to support this, uh, this, this action. Um, and it's been officially registered. So you're actually seeing how a form of political campaign uh, on the ground can produce um, a sort of organization, militant organization at the point of production. And also how that could form the basis of a real uh, campaigning leadership across the country. If you can link up campaigns like that, federate them somehow, that will be um, a more lasting achievement than either um, propagandizing for strike action in an empty way um, or um, simply declaring a campaign from above and hoping that, um, you know, if you call it, they will come. It's not going to work that way. Richard, thank you for your time. Uh, Unhitched is out now and is published by Verso Books. Uh, and uh, definitely pick it up. Uh, it's a fantastic read. And thank you for being so generous with your time. Oh, no problem. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you.